Hello and welcome everybody. Um, so we have two really exciting presentations today. Uh, the first group that you're going to hear from uh, is led by CUNY students, all of whom have transferred from Gutman Community College to four-year institutions. Uh, the undergraduates presenting today are Shade Barrett, Bashir Jawara, and Samantha Hernandez. Jawara is a junior at Hunter College who immigrated from Gambia via Spain and currently lives in the Bronx studying political science. Barrett is a junior also at Hunter studying sociology uh, to pursue her passion of writing. Hernandez is a junior at York College studying biology with the goal of entering the medical field. They've been working on the Voices from the Heart of Gotham, the undergraduate oral history collection at Gutman Community College that was founded in 2019. Uh, enjoy their presentation. CUNY's Gutman Community College undergraduates and alumni have gathered and curated approximately 200 student-produced testimonies for the Voices from the Heart of Gotham Archive. By collecting and writing about these oral histories, undergraduates at Gutman have become producers of knowledge in the midst of the historic movement. NYC's history of systematic violence against black communities and powerful movements of resistance position our city as a site for critical racial history. For us, students at CUNY, our home has become a focal point in the struggle for black lives. Given the experiences of, in our social networks and those of our peers, we realized these testimonies were vital to challenging the white supremacist and nativist systems that founded the United States and have proven central to the shaping of our city. This paper will focus on testimonies narrated between 2020 and 2022, centered on themes of protest in the aftermath of highly publicized incidents of police brutality. We will unveil and honor the pain and perseverance of a largely working class communities of color as they grapple with their place in society, often taking to the streets and their devices, demanding a more just home. The struggle against racism in NYC has been a longstanding battle. Like many other people of color, like Celia Perez, a Panamanian immigrant who came to America in the 80s, discusses how forward the prejudice she faced was and all of the opportunities she lost because of it. Racism here in New York is blatant and dangerous. I saw a lot of my dreams burn to dust. People at the hands of this racism suffered having their aspirations never come to fruition, knowing and learning places they could not venture into. Puerto Rican New Yorker and longtime Brooklyn resident Anna Flores remembers as a youth you couldn't go to a certain place because it was a white neighborhood. Those who have lived this multiple times over have stories of the segregation they faced with complex racial conflicts between POC and white immigrants in New York City. Interviewed in her 80s, Aracelas Otoro recalls life as a Puerto Rican migrant from her youth after immigrating in 1954. The Irish and the Italians didn't like the Puerto Ricans. Yes, they don't like the Puerto Ricans. They used to hit the Puerto Ricans, they used to call them names, and the Puerto Ricans were afraid of them. She remembers. I remember on Columbus Avenue between 100th Street and 96th Street, they used to have a sign, and the sign says, no blacks, no Puerto Ricans, and no pets. She continues. One time I remember a teacher said, why don't you just go back to your country? Yes, they used to tell you that. They didn't care for Puerto Ricans. She also remembers hostility from law enforcement. When I came to this country, you know, the policemen were really tall. They were Irish or Italian. They used to see the Puerto Ricans in a group. They used to say, break it up. If I see you around here, you're going to jail. One time, I remember his name was Malabi. He was in front of the building without a shirt. He was waiting for somebody, and the policeman came and just slapped him, just like that. This testimony is incredibly hurtful but also powerful. They show the hardship experienced in the past that still translates to today. Authority figures abusing their power and educators spreading xenophobia, which are memories that cannot be forgotten. They recall the fear of being battered and brutalized for existing within their own neighborhoods. The picture of these experiences from the past create a compelling narrative of fear and loss that continues to destabilize these communities that are trying to make something for themselves under an oppressive society that has remained so. America has been a land of immigrants 
since the first day British colonizers arrived at Jamestown, but it has never been a home to all immigrants. Immigrants youth of color are often persecuted for their ethnic identities. Tegida Fadiga, who was born in Senegal, West Africa, shared her experience. I miss the judgment-free environment where I wasn't judged or violated for who I am. Senegal is culturally diverse with almost 40 different languages, yet Tegida didn't experience the same level of judgment in her native country. Meanwhile, in the United States, known as land of immigrants and land of Im uh, home for immigrants, is judgmental to immigrants' youth, especially those with accent constantly get bullied in schools. Racism has always been embraced and often celebrated in the United States. Youth immigrants experience racism not only on the street, it reached the houses of learning. Sayara Uyudin, an immigrant youth, shared her experience of bullying and racism from middle school. She stated, in the past, I have been called ISIS, Osama, and a terrorist. Middle schoolers are not nice, and they forget that people come in all variations, not just one. Sadaf Majid, who also migrated to U.S. at a very young age, shared similar experience when she was bullied for wearing hijab. When I was in middle school, I remember my classmates once said to me on Halloween, what are you dressing up as? A terrorist? I heard many ignorant comments from the ignorant people. And because of these comments, I was actually afraid to wear a handcuff or hijab. Racist stereotypes such as these are harmful and traumatizing for immigrant youth, yet they are deeply ingrained in the fabric of American life. Through these testimonies, one can only conclude the centuries-long persecution of Black Americans is remorphing itself in modern day. Voices from the Heart of Gotham has documented multiple accounts from a friend of a friend or a family member that are Black or POC individuals feeling unsafe in America. Mm -hmm. This collection highlighted instances where people express feeling helpless, listening to the stories of harm come to their loved ones and sitting with the fact that nothing can be done. Kelly continues to recount the differences in raising black and brown children to prepare and best protect them from dangers they may encounter someday. I have not experienced a lot at the hands of police, but I've witnessed it and I have, certainly raising a black child. I have seen it. I've experienced it in the sense of the way that we have to have the talk, which means something different for parents of black and brown children. And that is the talk about how you deal with police. Numerous Numerous individuals live in racist systems without even realizing it, which in many ways allow racism to continue to persist. BIPOC residents of NYC frequently experience discrimination in school, employment, in the neighborhood, or even places of worship. Decal Baptiste, a 28-year-old from Freeport, Long Island, stresses the significance of institutional racism against um, African Americans and other minority groups in New York. I'm just fed up and someone of African-American descent or any type of minority commits a crime. Why are we being penalized in different race and different ways races are? Jeremy De La Cruz, a Dominican American from Washington Heights similarly expresses his displeasure and rage about how minorities are treated. When it comes to race, we'll never be equal. It's one of the worst things that could happen. You get accused of anything because of your skin tone. So I feel like when it comes to America, keep calm and continue walking because anything can happen to you in America. Being stereotyped isn't something new. Whether they're stereotyped themselves or stereotyped another group of people, most people have experienced stereotypical behavior. Depending on one's perspective, perspective exposure to other culture and current social struggle influences. This oversimplified and ambiguous concept may be held consciously or subconsciously. Stereotypes have the capacity to lead to unjustifying generalization that might lead to redirect rage at scapegoats. Amaya Lynn Melendez explains what may be too familiar to people of color. They automatically assume if you are raised in the hood, that means you're, that you are ghetto, that you like rap music. However, that's not true. You can't go along with things you believe. You have to go along with what you witness through the person yourself. This divide in treatment extends to protests as well. Ciara Uden conveys this treatment split by saying, 
I think it's sad to see how badly people of color are treated when they peacefully protest versus how white people protested on January 6th at the Capitol. You didn't see rubber bullets or tear gas when armed white people invaded the Capitol. David Burke hy hypothesized that the outcome would have been different if the Capitol riot had included individuals of color. Burke asserts, I do believe if that was a group of black folks entering the Capitol, I do believe that the repercussions would have been much more severe. I don't think they would have been able to make it home to their families and have dinner at 6 p.m. as those Trump supporters did. In response to the BLM nonviolent protest and January 6 protest, people have started to become more aware of problems in society. Luna Ruiz explains that she has become aware of how problematic the nation is. I think that the peaceful protesters were attacked a lot more physically and emotionally in the media and Trump supporters were kind of just empathized with a lot more. But I think again, that goes back to just race in this, in this country and how pervasive it is across the country. This understanding also changed how people reacted when members of the black community came out in favor of the BLM movement. Many of these white supremacists have, free, have frequently been given free reign to do as they want and to seize what they desire when they don't get their way. Jeremy De La Cruz shows his irritation at these white men who get away with things without warning. I feel like nothing has changed. As we know, Breonna Taylor got killed last month or a couple weeks ago. The, offer, the officer was barely charged with anything. I mean, the guy should have gone to jail and served time for justice. But I guess that's just how it is to be white. Now he's home, I guess, chilling. And we have an innocent lady who's in heaven without her family and her family is suffering the most, knowing that the guy that killed her is living his life normally right now. He stresses the reality of government authorities treating people of color differently from whites. Our research findings have shown that youth of color have experienced police treating them as the usual suspects. If you have any skin color other than white, you are automatically a suspect or target for police officers. When interviewing people of color, especially youth, they share their common experience of racist policy in America. Chair Broster, one of the interviews stated, police officers have profiles on people, especially black or brown people, thinking I'm a threat because of the color of my skin and my stature. Broster's experience is commonality in American society as police often show little respect or dignity toward youth of color. For instance, America, Mexican American Monse Herrera recalls, I am Latina, Mexican American. Growing up based on their personal encounters with the police, I have always felt intimidated, sort of scared. I have always had to watch what I say or how I say it. Police officers in the US often use power and fear to intimidate people of color. Based on the sentiment from the interviews, Youths of color often fear police because of the ways they have been treated compared to their white counterparts. Youths are not immune to modern, modif modif modern manifestation of profiling by the police. The structure of policy in America seems to be built to protect white people and white property from youths of color. Immigrant communities often lack trust in the police system. They often feel unsafe and discriminated against by the authorities. Maricel Rusoro, a Latina immigrant, explained her experience with the police. I always felt that there was issue with the police and the system in general. I think growing up in an immigrant family and being Latina myself, I have seen a lot of discrimination. I have experienced discrimination myself, whether it was from like a police authority or just authority in general. I think that I have always had maybe a bit of bias in feeling because I'm a person of color and treated a certain way. Lucero is demonstrating frustration that is common in immigrant communities, which is feelings of the discrimination and abuse of power by the police officers. Achieving and enacting social justice are challenging endeavors. Imani Hunt, a 19 year old patient care representative at CityMD expresses her frustrations of having to remind people that people of color matter as well. I've always felt like I had to tread lightly in this country simply because of who I am or what I did in class. It's never surprising to see one of your own being killed this way. 
it's more of a huge disappointment. Being born in black here means you're born aware of your place already. We wouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to be reminding people that we matter. The Cal Baptiste frustration with the persistence of inequality was palpable. Um, I don't feel like I'm being treated equally. I feel like a minority. We're just being taken for granted. We're un unappreciated. We're unable to reap the same benefits that other races are. Social justice activists like Baptiste and Hunt seek to assure e equability, justice in all spheres of society. However, the legal system is central to current demands for justice. Police officers have always held a unique position in society. Their stated purpose is to defend the innocent and serve the people. However, modern activists accuse law enforcement of defending property and the status quo. Their status provides them the authority to use force against citizens while doing their responsibility. Some black and brown individuals interviewed for this project demanded reforms despite themselves being employed in law enforcement. Born and raised in Honduras, Tadora Martinez immigrated to New York and became a correctional officer. Even though now she's a CEO, she recognized the need for change. Martinez explains, people need to change how they handle us minorities us Hispanics, us Black people, us Mexicans. We need to be treated the same, equal. That's all, that's what needs to be changed. People of color interviewed for this project generally did not reflect a positive opinion on the police in the United States. Can we blame them for thinking negatively and out of fear toward the police? In this project, we interview people of color to share their thoughts on an encounter they had with police. One of the interviewees, Amaya Melendez, a Hispanic woman, shared her thought on police. Cops always like to stereotype people of color. The Hispanic women, they like to make them spicy and conversious. They have African Americans. They always try to make them look uh, like they are angry and uneducated or they are on drugs or something like that. These negative stereotypes and assumptions by the police are very common in minority communities. Amaya stated that police like to profile African Americans as angry, uneducated, and drug users is a serious issue in policing. If the police officers are making such disgraceful assumptions toward a certain group of people, it shows they are probably have no good intention toward them. Amaya had the opportunity to share her experience and bring awareness about racial assumptions and stereotype police are making toward people of color. Like many of the interviews we had for this project, Amaya is tired and want to see structural policy be made to be more just and equitable for everyone, regardless of race or ethnicity. The anxiety and uneasiness some of these people experience whenever they had an encounter with the police is disheartening. People of color could easily be incarcerated by police because of the color of their skin. All these people want is to live in a society where police officers will protect them and make them feel home instead of police officers causing them trauma and anxiety. The treatment of people of color get from the police is beyond extreme when compared to their white counterpart. Ariana Vieira shared her view on the police has changed over the time. My opinion on police, it comes to, I think they were pretty good in the beginning when I was younger because of the relationship I had with, with my uncles. They were cops. But then I started getting older and I started realizing more. They are not trying to do what they are supposed to do, especially when it comes to old people, especially in New York. There are people with mental issues. They are not acute for that. So I see their first intake is to attack and not really kind of talked properly or like kind of approach them the situation correctly unless they are white. Ariana has police officers in her family, but that still did not stop her from perception on how inadequate and unjust the police operates in New York. Based on her personal observation on the police, Ariana believed that New York police are not properly trained for the job based on their approaches toward people with mental illness and their discriminatory treatment toward people of color. Ariana's last talk about the white privilege. Police officers treat white people with respect and dignity, which is something she has not seen them approach people of color with. 
this unprecedented behavior by police officers create more tension between them and Black Lives Matter movement. Chris Bertolotti, a New, Year New Jersey native currently living in New York, shared his thoughts on police handling the Black Lives Matter protests. There were peaceful protests and they were treated overly aggressive by the police. So I have a problem with that because it is right of an American to protest. And it's also hard for police when you have people yelling, no, yelling at you, God knows what they were saying in your face. It must be really hard to just sit there and take it in. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. It doesn't help to overreact and treat people badly when they are exercising their right to protest. Chris strongly believes that protesting is fundamental right for every American. And the way the police officers aggressively react to the Black Lives Matter protest was upsetting. Experiences was discussed in the courses of interviews conducted by Gutman Community College students. They ranged from peaceful protests to significantly more intense encounters with the police. Marisol explains her time protesting as significantly different from the way it's framed on TV. While the protests I participated in were all peaceful protests, I think it was a good experience for me to see. Just because, you know, I feel like the media was showing one side or like being biased towards one side, when in reality, the protests were not about looting. The protests were not about violence. The protests were about making a statement and standing with who you know the Black community is the most targeted by, the police. As a person of color, I include myself in that group. Going to the protest was very different than watching it on TV, and it made me feel like at least I'm there and supporting. Of course, you don't have to go to the protest to support the movement, but for me, it felt like something I wanted to do, I needed to do. According to those interviewed for this project, New York City became the epicenter of protesting in large part due to its diversity. 21-year-old Brooklyn native Marlo Sosso explains, New York City has always been very outspoken. It has always been a hub for not only cultural awareness, for example, people were rioting and protesting for acceptance and fair treatment of the LGBTQ plus people and has a very diverse population of race, ethnicity, and countries of origin. Just a very diverse population and a very large population. A lot of people genuinely care about this. Correspondingly, Harlem resident Imani Hunt has similar thoughts. She also explains, we're in a place where so many different cultures meet and it makes us more sensitive to issues here. Can't say that about other places. People actually see how important black lives are here. As sad as it is, as this is, not everyone thinks that. 21 year old Asian American New Yorker, Grace Howe confirms the sentiment that NYC's diversity plays a major role in the widespread BMO movement. However, she adds that the city's activist roots help make it fertile grounds for social justice uprising. How states, NYC is a melting pot of ethnicities, culture, culture identities, it's been a real place that has supported rights for minorities, stonewalls for LTBGTQI plus rights. And a lot of protesters here people who identify themselves as activists will stand up for rights of others, even if it may not fall into the group and the city, if they fall into the group and the city has protections on protesting. These demonstrations weren't only about combating racism. They were also about spreading knowledge and teaching people about things that might not be apparent to individuals who haven't encountered racist attitudes through the use of popular education people have also united to become activists. When David Burke was interviewed, he explained how the Black Lives Matter movement influenced his perspective of things and wanted to educate others. He states, we've seen countless occasions across the nation, not just in any one city, where a person of color have succumbed at the hands of those who are meant to protect and serve us at the hands of police officers. So I do believe that the movement should continue to educate folks and you know, sometimes people who may be racist might not consider it. They might not be conscious of that fact. So we have to continue to educate each other so that we can kill any sort of racist cancer. Students frequently come to the realization that they learn through popular education rather than through historical textbooks that may be used in classrooms. 
When asked by her interviewer, did you learn more about the history of racism in this country since the protests started? Amani Hunt replied, I feel like I have, yes. I feel like honestly TikTok has become more educational in that sense because there were incidents that I had never even heard of. I didn't even know as a thing. For example, like the Tulsa fires, the town that was primarily black was burned down. And this was a thing that was happening a lot. I didn't know much that, I didn't know that that was a thing. Amani's interviewer replied, I feel high school didn't teach us much. Amani concurred. They like maybe skimmed over a lot. It was called the Tulsa race massacre. It took place on May 31st and June 1st of, 20, of 1921, when mobs of white residents, many of them, were given weapons by city officials, attacked black residents and businesses of the Greenwood district in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This was a thing that I did not know anything about. It's bad that they skimmed over that. It says a lot. The link between race, class, gender, and sexual orientation is being rethought in significant ways as a result of the Black Lives Matters movement and other comparable current organization initiatives. There is a clear understanding of how these components are related to one another. The solidarity manifested, manifesting around BML offers a great deal of potential for change and frustration for limited movement and social justice thus far. Amanda, um, Amaya Lynn Melendez is ag aggy about the lack of change despite the obvious needs. Just because you don't know the person that got murdered on national TV doesn't mean you can't sympathize in actually saying that what was done to them was wrong. Still, linkages are being made by interviewees that struggle against racism must be intersectional. Marisol Lucero shares, I think that we're just tired and it's time to really create change and not just say it. It to be a trending topic, but for real change to happen in all different types of systems, health systems, police systems, political. Shania Brown, a 19 year old peer mentor at Gutman Community College describes her anger with the seemingly unmovable structures of society. Brown is unhappy with the way events have turned out. I think at its, I think I look at it as that frustration of wanting to start over society, wanting a new society, wanting justice. We can't start over. We can't start over and go back to where we don't even know where from or where we came from. Even if certain instances of racism are harsher than others, racism is nonetheless present throughout the nation. No matter how someone acts, looks, or even speaks, anything that defines who they are we should all be treated equally. Uh, we've heard from the presentations and now we're gonna open it up to questions from our presenters. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, thank you, I would send off to my audience. Um, mm -hmm. Keep reading the financial story of the year and the whole offer and different things and projects. Um, I'm not personally on TikTok and I was just wondering bit more about that and it's more about the really interesting um and I'm, I'm really open about that aspect of everything um so I don't know somewhat if, can you hear me okay is that okay great um I was on uh TikTok a lot when quarantine started just because I was mainly inside um, and when everything with like the protests was going on, I was predominantly like on black TikTok. So a lot of black creators were kind of making more content that was curated towards um, like aspects of our history that we weren't aware of. So they would title things like um, things that you never learned in school or things that you didn't know or things that could possibly be um, like left out. Uh, I think a popular reference for a while, if I'm not mistaking the name of it, is Lake Lanier, I think, um, which is a lake down south, essentially, that used to be a Black community um, that eventually was turned into a lake after that community was essentially uh, massacred, removed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was just known as a pretty popular um, like boating area now, but along the 
black community, it's kind of known as a place that you don't go simply because of like the the people that died there and some of like their long held beliefs about um just the tormented people that essentially have been laid there to rest unjustly unfortunately um so i i think at least in my experience it's mostly i've mostly seen a lot of other black creators kind of come to the fold um and talk about some of the like knowledge that they have that aren't things that can be taught in schools especially when you move farther from the north like you are in new york and you move farther down to say like the midwest or the south those aren't necessarily things um that are taught or put into curriculums specifically so i, I guess coming from my perspective of someone who's consuming the content um it was more for black people or black audiences um, simply because there's a fairly large population of Black people that still live in the South to this day, just because they decided not to migrate like up North when uh, they eventually got their emancipation. Um, and so a lot of people in those schools didn't exactly have like that information. Um, I mean, it's public, so everyone uh, is available to like consume that and kind of learn from it. Um, but a lot of uh, people that I was watching were very specific about like, you can stay and you can learn from me, but this isn't necessarily um, like your space. Like I'm taking the time to build this community um, and this information and this education primarily for us, but you're more than welcome to consume the content and learn more if it's something that you're not knowledgeable about in that way. Um, I'm not on TikTok. I usually don't go there. Um, I think when we talk about social media, it's really fascinating because we are living in a world now where everything is in tech. Um, what is great about social media, you can retweet. Uh, since I'm a Twitter kind of guy, you can retweet, you can like when, when, whenever you like your post. Those that follow you will see it again. So. Um, some of these great content in Twitter, they're not mainly only for black people, but to rather educate the public in general. Like my colleague Shade was saying, um, some of the textbooks are not allowed in schools. And even if they are allowed, there's so much to teach. You can't incorporate all of that. So social media has been a space where whenever injustice is happening again, you kind of just record it and send it online so that the general, general public is aware of it. It kind of be a, um, a model for us to teach our young kids to, to really um, be kind and know their history and know things about um, society they don't necessarily know in school. So it, it takes everyone because social media can be unkind too. You can see a lot of things, a lot of abuse in social media, a lot of racist posts, um, attacking individuals, attacking communities, so it depends on the person and what you are uh, putting on the social media. That's why uh, Shade uh, she, uh, followed uh, this specific individual who is trying to build a Black community and try to learn more about uh, Black communities. I just wanted to share that this this was like a common thing throughout my years of high school. Um, my history teacher wanted to teach us like history that isn't typically taught throughout high school in the US. And he had um, one of our classmates post on social media, should they, should women have the choice for suffrage, the, the, the other form of voting, I, I can't remember the word exactly. And everybody voted no, but it was just because it was the lack of education and people just didn't understand half of what was being posted. And the classmate came back and showed everybody and then we just went forward and posted so much on Facebook for people to understand and it was being shared all over the place. Then he eventually followed on to TikTok and Instagram and things like that. So there is a bunch of power throughout social media. Yeah. 
Oh uh, yeah. Uh, so, and you guys can answer this too because you've given presentations about this. But they're asking about the question about uh, oral history as transformative dialogue. Um, in what ways can you all comment to that? take a take a stab at it um i think uh a lot of what the the online and high school group touched on um is being interviewed by someone that has the same exact identity as you so you get a chance for just someone to talk to you more clearly and authentically about their experiences. So it creates a form of exchange that can be more valuable to the information that you're trying to get out to the public because you're not um, necessarily worried about um, like unnecessary bias or any like harmful rhetoric that could come from someone mistranslating your words because you're interviewed by someone who is a part of your community and you'll understand that even if you're not speaking um, properly like if you're using AAVE or what other people refer to as like um, like slang or I, I don't know if other people refer to it as Ebonics still <laughs> but you um, you know that that person is not going to misconstrue the message and the statement of what it is that you're trying to say. Yeah, um, for me, I think I'm going to go back to what Shadi mentioned before. When you are interviewed by um, those that looks like you without any restrictions, it gives you a space to be your true self. If you have been interviewed by media about uh, some of the social injustice issues, there might be things you don't want to share because you don't feel comfortable with the media or they are using your words uh, improperly, like the way you mentioned. Our projects, we have interviewed um, immigrant communities. We have interviewed communities of color. We have interviewed youths like uh, these high schoolers have done, documenting their experiences through COVID. And this has been powerful and transformative. I am part of the MBK, my brother's keeper. Uh, my brother's keeper is also a foundation which is uh, working with uh, young men of color, um, a foundation organized and created by uh, President Barack Obama. So this gives youths of color an opportunity to interview themselves, talk about their experiences, because if, the, if they don't, there are media that they don't care about them. Usually, we don't only tell about sad stories. We also tell about the beauty of our communities. Media always, whenever they come to people of color, they always see the bad things. They want you to talk about the bad things, how sad you are, how oppressed you are, you know, how deeply affected you are. But whenever we have uh, opportunities through oral histories, we are able to talk about the joys, even though we have been suffering, we have been able to talk about the days our families have been together, laughing, smiling, hugging and all of that joy, all of that beauty, all of that beauty in our blackness, our pride. So being able to be having the chance and opportunity through all our history is really phenomenal things because if we don't have this, who else will be there for us? So this is a platform we are creating for ourselves rather than waiting for other people to come and say, let's help us, let, let us help you. We have been our own helping hands. I think that is why this oral history through transformative is very important. Uh, for me, I I just recently graduated from a community college, transferring to senior college to get my associate. And I was also serving as a student government association president, doing oral history and working full time. It was not the easiest thing to do. It was um, extremely exhausting. Um, at the same time, I was really I'm still um, uh, passionate about playing soccer. Whenever I am dealing with um, uh, stress or uh, doing oral histories, um, I usually go to the park to play soccer. Um, over here, they call it football, yes. Um, I'm from Gambia, so we also call it football. Um, I don't know why Americans call their football football which is confusing. <laughs> this is the real football. <laughs> You're kicking with your foot. Uh, but that's what I do. I, I go play, have fun, because at the end of the day, I cannot serve 
the world problem. I have to give myself space uh, to breathe. Even though I'm always optimistic, I know for sure that I cannot solve everybody's problem. I can only do so much. And as long that I know that I did my part listening to them, I know that I will have the pride in myself and be proud of myself. The fact that I listen to their stories, I try to help everyone the best way I can because I know there are people who doesn't care. At least with the researchers, we care. We help to raise their voices, those that are suffering. So I feel like we did our part, so it's my part to go enjoy and have fun sometimes. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, we'll see you at wine. <laughs>